welcome to One Church this hopefully nice Sunday morning. Um, you probably can just tell this already, but um, I'm not recording this on Sunday. This isn't live this week, and that's because this Sunday and next Sunday are a little bit different. Um, as we look together towards like coming back into Florence Road and having those lovely Sunday mornings together that we've wanted to have for so long, um, we thought it'd be really good in, in the build up to that to have some time where the kids and families could come into the space um, and have a couple of Sunday mornings that are kind of really designed around them and getting them back into the space and re-familiarising them and um, helping them to kind of look forward to that gathered time again. So um, this Sunday and next Sunday, the kind of in-person stuff at Florence Road is for families and kids, but we don't want to leave the rest of you out. Um, of course, and so what we thought we'd do is to kind of do some pre-recorded stuff this Sunday and next Sunday um, where we carry on going through some of these great stories about Jesus's life and ministry and, and the way that he interacted with people um, and hopefully this time will be a really helpful time for you. Um, I want to encourage you just at the beginning to to try and treat this as kind of no less of a live thing even though it's not live as you would normally do. So um, kind of safeguard this space. If you can put your phone away, put your phone away. If you can um, kind of just let go of some of the other things that are going on, um, then let go of some of the other things that are going on to help you really, really engage with this space. This morning we're going to be focusing around a story from John's Gospel really early on. Um, the story of when a guy called Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus at night. Uh, it's a really beautiful story. It's quite a dense story. Um, and what I wanted to do just to start off with is to give a bit of a time of reflection. Um, for those of you who know John's Gospel, you'll know that John is a big fan of some like massive repeating concepts. He'll talk loads throughout the whole book, his whole account of Jesus's life, about the idea of God's light shining in the darkness or about God's judgment coming in the world and, and what that means, what that concept even looks like, or about um, freedom or about testifying and testimony. It's like there's this kind of court thing that goes through the book. Anyway, what I wanted to do is just to begin with a bit of time to meditate on some of those thoughts and phrases to kind of get us into the language of John. Um, so we're going to hear a little reading from John 1 and then we're going to have a song together that as normal you can join in with however best suits you. You can uh, sing along or you can just kind of safeguard the space and let it wash over you and just be in it. Uh, but it's a song that picks up on a lot of these beautiful kind of Johnny um, concepts and turns them uh, into worship. And so let's do that. Let's have a reading from John 1 and then this song together. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light and so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth.
In a moment, we're going to have the story, today's story, read for us by Judith. Um, just before we do that, I want us to kind of treat this reading um, as a bit of a, a meditation in its own right um, and to kind of really, really engage with it. And I think something that might help us to do that is to try, just for a moment before the reading starts, to kind of put ourselves a little bit into Nicodemus's shoes. We don't know loads about this guy, but we know a few things. Firstly, we know that while Jesus was in Jerusalem, um, this guy, Nicodemus, really desperately wanted to see him while he was there. Jesus was from the north of the country, um, but kind of would travel down to Jerusalem like most Jews would for the festivals. Um, and Nicodemus is one of the kind of religious ruling elite. He's a Pharisee. He's a member of the kind of uh, this close knit group of people who were kind of the the gatekeepers of some of the organised religion of that time. Um, and so we know that Nicodemus is this guy who's been deeply intrigued by Jesus. He's heard of some of the stuff that Jesus has been doing. He's maybe he's he's maybe he was there in the temple when Jesus was throwing over the tables and causing all of a ruckus. And already um, a lot of Nicodemus's peers, a lot of the kind of the other Pharisees are starting to really, really feel uncomfortable about Jesus's presence with them um, and don't really like him. But Nicodemus, he's kind of intrigued, like he wants to know more. And so we're told at the beginning of this story that he sets out at night. So he waits until it's dark, he waits till everyone's in bed, he waits till no one will see him go. And then he wanders over to where Jesus is staying. Now he's not staying at his own house. Jesus is staying probably with some friends, presumably in Bethany with um, Martha and Mary and Lazarus in their house, which is just down a little valley and up again from the main city of Jerusalem. And so Nicodemus has to go on this half hour, 40 minute walk in the dark to find the place where Jesus is staying. And just for a moment, before we have this story read, I want to ask you to imagine that being your journey. Imagine having seen Jesus at a distance. Imagine the kind of the feeling of, of threat that this guy might just turn over a lot of the stuff that you feel like you stand for. And yet there's something about him you can't let go of. You can't just let pass by. You know that you need to see this guy. Imagine the feeling of wandering through the streets, worrying that you'll see someone who asks you where you're going. Imagine the sense of nervousness, of anticipation. What will he say? What questions do I want to ask? What do I want from this guy? What do I even want to know? Why am I even on this journey? What will Jesus say to me when I get there? How shall I open the conversation? Where do I begin? Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Well, like I said earlier, I'm really interested in how you found that. Um, trying to put yourself in the position of Nicodemus and then hearing that story told again. Um, if this were a normal Sunday, I would ask you. But as it isn't, I've just got to tell you what how I found it. Um, I found this week, the more I've read that passage and the more I've thought about Nicodemus and, and his perspective, the more jarring, the more uncomfortable, maybe even the more unsettling I've found this conversation. Um, when we think about Jesus's conversations with, with individuals, we often think that you know, Jesus has this amazing ability to start exactly where someone is, like to, to speak the word, the phrase that will draw them out, that will open them up, that will bring them into the kind of the, the next bit of understanding, the next part of their journey with him that they really, really need, like the a word of healing, a word of encouragement or whatever. Um, and I think it was really helpful the way Dave kind of said this last week, but often Jesus's encounters with individuals aren't all that easy. They're not you know, to use that kind of old fashioned C S Lewis word, they're not they're not tame. Jesus is kind of He's almost a little bit, I don't know if this is blasphemy to say, but he's a bit annoying in this passage. Do you feel like, as Nicodemus, like he comes in, he says, hi, Jesus, you know, basically like, you know, we've heard that you're from God. We know you're from God. And Jesus just like comes in straight away. Mm, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And, and it's like Nicodemus doesn't have time to catch his breath the entire way through the conversation uh, beyond just to be like, uh, what? And then Jesus will be like, you don't understand, come on, what hope is there if you don't understand? And then he just rattles through all these massive kind of concepts of like um, light shining in the darkness. And and um, in fact, am I just quoting from John 1? I can't remember. Um, but like tons of massive stuff, like this is the judgment, how the Son of Man will be lifted up and, and Moses put a snake on a stick and, and you've got to be born again and flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit and and there's just kind of no let up it's hardly a conversation it feels like nearly Jesus's excuse for a monologue like he doesn't really respond back to Nicodemus at all and I, I, to be honest I found that really intriguing this week like I wonder 
I wonder why. What, what's going on in this passage? And, and more than that, what can, I, what can I learn from this passage? Like in some ways, this is a really, really famous story, isn't it? We know um, tons and tons of sermons have been preached on John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And, and, and for a lot of us, we'll have grown up alongside this language of being born again, of having this transform transformative moment where we are kind of brought into faith and brought into relationship with God and, and our lives are changed forever. Um, and, and so this passage kind of, from that point of view, it seems like, well, this is just lovely and it's a bit straightforward and there's these two moments. But there's all this other stuff around it that seems pretty deeply confusing. And as I read it through the lens of like Jesus's encounter with Nicodemus, what I'm left feeling is what was Jesus really hoping would be Nicodemus's response? Like what was what was the hoped outcome from from this moment? I feel like often we treat these moments of encounter with Jesus as like either there's a right response to it or there's a wrong response to it. So, you know, take, for example, the idea of being born again. Maybe this is Nicodemus being offered this chance, this one evening, this chance to be born again. Is Jesus kind of giving him this altar call? And either Nicodemus in this one moment is going to accept the call. Will he be born again? Will he, will his life be transformed forever into this kind of kingdom lover of Jesus? Or, or will he reject it? Will he go his own way? Will he love darkness instead of the light because his deeds are evil, to use the language of Jesus? Um, and I don't quite feel like that binary works that well in this story um, and I'm going to kind of circle back to that so just kind of remember that is there a right response and a wrong response um, and I want to kind of do a little bit of circling back by talking about um, something that I mentioned earlier this moment with Nicodemus isn't just a story where it's Jesus's moment with Nicodemus this is also Jesus's first kind of preachy moment in John's gospel um, up until now, the narrator, John, has said a lot. Uh, John the Baptist has said a lot. Jesus has only said a few words like, come and stay with me, come and sit with me. And, and he's turned the water into wine. And, and there's, been, there's been some stuff going on that's been very cool and very interesting. But there hasn't been this kind of opening speech from Jesus about what he's really about. Now think about, again, earlier, um, do you remember I said that in John there's these continuing concepts all the way through, like God's love coming into the world and, and love versus hate and life versus death and light versus darkness and judgment versus truthfulness and, and or lies versus truthfulness and, and all these kind of motifs keep on going and all of them have something to say, something to kind of unravel about what the kingdom of God means, about what following Jesus means, about what life with Jesus means. But for the reader of John, you're not supposed to just read John 1 and read John 3 and understand it all. The, the process of understanding, the process of waking up to these new realities happens through the whole book, happens through the whole story, happens through this Un, un, unending narrative of Jesus being the light and being the love. Now that might sound like kind of an incidental point but I think it's really important as we look at passages like this because I think what John the writer is trying to do in this passage is not saying that just all of you will have this one moment where you have to choose and you have to choose to be born again. You have to choose to believe in the sun and then that's it and your life changes forever. And the reason I don't think that's true is that firstly, um, that's not what we see. I don't know if this is firstly, this might be only, um, is that that's just not how Nicodemus's life looks. He comes up again a couple of times throughout this gospel and um, and he comes up like once in the context of being with his kind of Jewish ruling council thing with his peers, uh, kind of standing up for Jesus when they like, just, we shouldn't judge this guy too, too like uh, harshly or too um, unnecessarily like, you know, let's, let's be wise in how we do this and let's be kind in how we do this. So there's kind of that one moment where he seems to sort of be sticking up for Jesus. And then there's this moment after the crucifixion when Jesus has been killed 
and Nicodemus joins Joseph of Arimathea in bringing the body and and caring for the body and burying it in a tomb um, and both of those things show I think that there's this enduring intrigue there's this enduring journey for Nicodemus but equally it's not like oh his life has been just immediately turned around now he's a passionate advocate for Jesus he's he's outed himself as a Christian or whatever word he would have used and he's just kind of on fire for God like does that make sense it's kind of a, it's a bit more nuanced than that so this guy who hears the original sermon you must be born again then goes on to have seemingly a fairly interestingly nuanced journey which makes me kind of think what is John's purpose in telling this story to us does he expect us to 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 hear John 3 read for the first time and understand all the concepts in it or is he trying to do something else I think he's trying to do two things um, so without kind of going really into depth with all these concepts which are really cool concepts I think Jesus is trying to do two things with Nicodemus Firstly, I think he's genuinely trying to unsettle him. Do you remember how we talked about how this conversation feels a little bit unfair? It feels a little bit abrupt. It feels like a race. It feels like a rush. I think there's a reason and I think there's a kindness behind that from Jesus's point of view. I think Jesus wants Nicodemus to go away from this conversation, maybe not having made a decision for Christ, but maybe just feeling oh my gosh, there is so much more here. And the way that I've been doing things cannot go on. Like all this stuff about, um, you know, the way that you religious leaders understand stuff, it's gotten you this far, but it can't get you any further. You need to be born again. You need a new start. You need a new change. We need a new religion that's, that's, uh, that's not based around um, just ethnic uh, like your ethnic heritage or based around your religious obedience but it's based around something else it's based around coming alive so I think that if this passage left you feeling a little bit unsettled then I think that's I think that's actually a kindness I think that's maybe what Jesus was trying to do um, with Nicodemus um, do you remember a couple of months ago when we were talking about all the Brian McLaren stuff of, of some stages of faith and some putting some language to how our faith can can develop and inevitably for all of us our faith will have developed over time um, and he said that to, to move from kind of one stage of faith to your next stage of faith whatever kind of step that is involves a process of kind of jarring of doubt of like a kind of um, now I'm going to forget, what are those um, seashell animals that make the pearls? Is it mussels? This is going to be very embarrassing when this goes out, but like that process of like it's the rubbing, it's the abrasiveness that produces the beauty that you need. Um, Jesus doesn't just need to always be super kind to us. Sometimes he needs to offer us a challenge. Sometimes he needs to leave us unsettled because there's some stuff that needs leaving behind. Um, and so for, for, for Nicodemus, there's this sense of, no, you need, you need a change. There needs to be a change to how you do your faith. Um, that's probably a good challenge for all of us, isn't it? Because for all of us, none of, none of us will be watching this thinking, hey, I've completed Christianity. Tick, I've gotten there. There will always be this need for, for us to be unsettled by the presence of Christ. Um, and then the, the other thing... Um, is I think Jesus is trying to, in just kind of bombarding him and in bombarding us with all this information, um, I think he's inviting us into something that is, that just is obviously vast, that's obviously massive. Um, did you notice how um, Jesus is kind of, he uses so much language that is massively inclusive that's massively kind of world sized so like you know it, it's not just if you're if you're jewish and believe it's not just if you're a pharisee and believe it's not just if you're right about all the answers and believe it's whoever um looks to jesus gets in on this new life it's this is available to everyone it's 
God loved not just this nation, but God loves the whole world. And God comes to save, not to judge the whole world. That Jesus is using this, this moment with Nicodemus to kind of break him out of where his religion has shrunk to the size of his people group or to the size of his tribe or to the size of his expectation. Um, and he's blowing it open so that Nicodemus leaves thinking, oh my gosh, this is so much bigger than I thought. Um, and the way to access it, the way to see it, the way to learn it is weirdly, and I know the language of being born again is super complex and can be kind of like, well, what does that mean? And what are... I think at least a part of what it means is how Jesus talks about it in the other Gospels, where he says, if, you're, if you think of yourself as an adult, if you think of yourself as wise, you're going to really struggle. You need to start again as a child. You need to throw away that bit of you that thinks you're an expert in Christianity, that thinks you're an expert in Judaism, um, before you can see what this is really about. If you're coming here as a know-it-all, you will miss it all. But if you come here ready to start again, ready to start with the innocence and inexperience um, of a new baby, then you can see life, and then you can see this beauty. And I kind of think, oh, that's really cool as well. Like, what if what Jesus wants to do, at least in part through this passage, is to say, look, open your eyes again to just how big the salvation that God is trying to bring into the world, that God is bringing into the world through Jesus. Look how God is redeeming the entire cosmos. Look how God is drawing, in, in the language of John, drawing all men, drawing all people <laughs> to himself. Look how, how generous this is. Look how vast this is. Um, if you think you're on top of the hill, you'll probably miss it. But if you think, if you're ready um, to learn again and to be like a child again, then you'll probably see it. We're going to finish now with a song. And uh, the reason I picked this song, the reason I love it, uh, is that it feels like it's it's doing something of what this passage is doing. So it's drawing us into a new way of seeing, um, into a new way of seeing this invasion of light and love that the whole gospel is all about, that Jesus is all about, that Jesus came to save the whole world. And this song is about seeing that, it's about learning to kind of um, see the world the way Jesus sees it and to see the kingdom coming um, the way Jesus sees it. So let's do this and then we'll say the grace together and then we'll close. I see the world breaking and falling apart And I don't know what to do with it What to do with it See hey building up all of the walls turns family into enemy what do you do with it?
we're going to finish by saying the grace together and in a few weeks time we're going to be able to do this hopefully all a lot more of us in person and looking into each other's faces um, which might feel odd um, but for one of the last times hopefully let's say the grace together in this kind of distant form so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.